Today we will learn and reflect on St. Augustine's essay on Catechizing the Uninstructed. This essay was referenced twice in the Catholic Catechism. The first reference reminds us that St. Augustine teaches us that envy is a diabolical sin. The Catechism could reference this point from any dozens of other works, but they chose this work so the faithful would be encouraged to study it on their own, which is what we'll do today. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video in my blogs, and you can follow along in our script shared on SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Where is St. Augustine's work, Catechizing the Uninstructed, referenced in the Catechism? Well, in paragraph 2539, we read in the Catechism that envy is a capital sin. It refers to the sight of another's goods and the immoderate desire to acquire them for oneself, even unjustly. When it wishes grave harm to a neighbor, envy is a mortal sin. And the footnote in the Catechism referencing St. Augustine's work says this, St. Augustine saw envy as the diabolical sin. And St. Augustine's work is also referenced in paragraph 281, where it notes that the new creation in Christ is celebrated in the ancient rites of baptism. A fellow deacon asked his bishop, who was St. Augustine, for advice on how to conduct an effective catechetical class to prepare his new converts for baptism and admission into the church. St. Augustine responded with a discourse titled, Catechizing the Uninstructed. This discourse is an epistle which was no doubt read aloud to many deacons and possibly to many parishes, and is an excellent glimpse into the soul of the ancient church. The sections of Catechizing the Uninstructed are, first, it describes the core teachings of the Christian faith and life that need to be explained to the catechumens. And he has advice on how his deacon can be an effective instructor and how he can nurture the faith of both the uneducated and the intellectual catechumen, and how he can overcome the weariness or burnout ministers sometimes feel. Also, St. Augustine has this long-suggested discourse that his deacon can deliver to his catechumens to prepare them to live their lives as true Christians. And St. Augustine offers advice on how to counsel potential converts and catechumens. And St. Augustine also has a shorter suggested talk on the Christian faith that his deacon can adapt in his discussions with potential converts. And going through the core teachings of the Christian faith, in all his writings, St. Augustine reminds us that the core of our faith is the commands to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. In his work on catechesis, St. Augustine teaches us the vice that ruins love, the vice that is the enemy of love, and that is envy, and that the mother of envy is pride. God showed his love for us by sending a son. And St. Augustine quotes from scriptures, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. We should love one another and lay down our life for the brethren, even as Christ laid down his life for us. No, it may be a chore to love a God up there in the heavens somewhere, but for Christians it is a joy to love a God who lived among us as one of us. St. Augustine reminds us that Christ came so a man will learn how much God loves him. So a man will be kindled to love God who first loved him, so we will love our neighbor as we love Christ, who has become our neighbor by living among us. This love of God for us commands us to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now this hangs the law and the prophets, and all other scriptures. Just as in the Old Testament there is a veiling of the New, so the New Testament is an unveiling of the Old. The remedy for the pride that leads us to love-destroying envy is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is both God and man, is both a manifestation of divine love towards us, and an example of human humility living with us. Thus, the misery of proud men is cured by a greater mercy, a humble God. What is common to all converts? Everyone who wishes to be a Christian has been smitten with some sort of fear of God. Some converts may come with a false heart saying this or that, but the very untruth that he utters should be the point from which we start his journey down the path of faith. 
Rather than confront his imperfections, we should praise the person he wants to become. So the budding catechumen will feel it a pleasure to become the kind of man that he actually wants to be. And reproving him with more than usual kindness and gentleness to come to a truer understanding of Christian charity and faith. St. Augustine has much advice for the catechumen and his instructor. He counsels that the catechumen seek inspiration primarily from scriptures and not seek personal revelations and dreams. He also cautions that when the catechumen begins to progress in moral qualities and knowledge and enters into the way of Christ with ardor, that he will not be so bold as to credit his progress either to the instructor or himself, but that he should love all for the sake of the Lord who loved him. We won't go over all of his advice to combat the weariness in both the minister and the catechumen. St. Augustine observes that the minister tires of answering the same questions from ignorant believers time and time again, should instead be cheerful in his duties, for God loves a cheerful giver. The minister should remember the patience of Jesus when he answered the simple human questions, responding in parables that even the simplest believer could understand. If Jesus got incarnate, whose infinite knowledge and faith was far greater than the knowledge and faith of any minister, could always be joyful and patient when teaching his disciples and followers, we need to realize how much simpler it is for us to show patience and joy when speaking to the simple believer. St. Augustine, in this section of Catechizing the Uninstructed, includes a suggested homily to catechumens that his deacon can modify to fit his needs. The discourse starts by asking, how can we find the tranquility and security from the great and dangerous storms of this world? We could seek security from wealth, but the man who seeks security from wealth is rendered proud rather than at ease. We could seek honors from this world, but both wealth and honor could disappear in an instant. Likewise, we should not seek pleasure and riches in dainty meats and fornications, for the pleasures of this world only bring false happiness and harm to our soul. Rather than trust in mortal and transitory things, we should fix our attention on the eternal word of the Lord, so we can cleave to that which endures forever. If you seek to become a Christian for social or temporal reasons, you may backslide from the faith when you see wicked and impious men who are more prosperous than you are. You may ask yourself, how is this faith helping me? Now this is the wrong question, for the true Christian seeks everlasting blessedness and the perpetual rest of the saints so that he may not pass into eternal fire with the devil, but rather enter into the eternal kingdom together with Christ. He will be on his guard in every temptation. So we will neither be corrupted by prosperity, nor be utterly broken in spirit by adversity, but remain modest and temperate during good times, and be brave and patient during times of tribulation. Then this Christian will love God more than he fears hell, and will recoil from the evil thoughts and temptations. St. Augustine teaches us, we ought to love God who has so loved us to send his only Son, so that he may humble himself with the lowliness of our mortality, and die at the hands of and on behalf of sinners. God is the most merciful and patient with ungodly men, and offers them penance and amendment. Then St. Augustine recounts the history of the church, the rescue of Israel from bondage in Egypt, the wood of the rod of Moses parting the waters of the Red Sea, which prefigures the wood of the cross. The righteous passing through the walled up waters which then fell upon the chariots of the Pharaoh, which preconfigures the waters of baptism, by which the faithful pass into new life while their sins are done away with like enemies and perish. Likewise, the passion of Christ was prefigured when the Israelites were commanded to slay and eat the lamb and mark their doorposts with its blood, so the angel of death would pass over the houses of the Israelites. This smearing of the blood of the Lamb prophecies the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. When they were given the Decalogue, the Israelites received the law written on stone by the finger of God. The stone signifies the hardness of their heart when they were not able to fulfill the law. And St. Augustine Discourses relates the six ages of the world, the ages of Adam, Abraham, King David, the Babylonian captivity, the age starting from the return from Babylon, and the sixth age of the coming of Christ into the world. In this sixth age, the mind of man may be renewed after the image of God, even as on the sixth day man was made after the image of God. In this sixth age, the law was fulfilled, 
as Christ was born of a mother who conceived without being touched by man, in virginity conceiving, and in virginity giving birth, and in virginity dying, but who had nevertheless been espoused to the Holy Spirit, extinguishing the flame of carnal nobility. Christ was born in the lowly village of Bethlehem, born poor, so believers may not boast of earthly riches. Christ refused to be made by man a king, so he in his humility conquers the pride that separates man from God, yet he is king of an everlasting kingdom. He who is hungry and thirsty feeds all men and quenches the thirst of all men. The commandments of the Decalogue were reduced to two, that we should love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, as the Lord himself declared in the gospel and in his own example. And you say, well, we've said this before. Well, St. Augustine says this point over and over in this work and in many of his other works. And that's one of the reasons why I like St. Augustine. He says that over and over and over again, never lets us forget it. And the 50 days from Passover to the day the Lord wrote the Decalogue on the Rock of the Tablets prefigures the 50 days from the Passion and Resurrection of the Lord's Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended in a violent wind from heaven, appearing as flames on the apostles, giving them the power to speak in the languages of those who heard the gospel, the good news of salvation. And St. Augustine discusses also about making offerings for the poor among them. This discourse reminds us that the early Christians did not seek to join the church for temporal benefits, but rather the early Christians sought in an immortal fashion to love Christ, who in mortal fashion suffered crucifixion and death, on their behalf at their own hands, giving them the gift of forgiveness for all their sins. Ardent in their love for Christ, they sold all they had, laying the price of their possessions at the feet of the apostles, so they may be distributed among them according to their need. And living in Christian love harmoniously with one another, they did not claim to own anything, but held all things in common, and were one in soul and heart towards God. This discourse tells us that St. Paul was able to reach this level of perfection in his later Christian communities, since the later Christians could not readily serve God by selling and distributing their possessions, they instead should make offerings for the poor brethren among the saints of the churches of Judea, which had believed in Christ. Thus, charity for the poor was important to the early church, an emphasis that has been diminished or lost entirely in many churches today. The final section of the Discourse to the Catechumens quotes the Gospel, For not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Do not worry about the bad example of those who do not follow the will of the Father, but have prosperity and honor in this world. For it is not according to their opinion, but according to his truth, that you will be judged. Associate with the good whom you perceive to be at one with you in loving your king. And it is one thing to love man, and another to set one's hope in man. And the difference is so great that God urges us to love our neighbor, but forbids us to put our hope in man. Be humble towards God, so he will not permit you to be tempted beyond your strength. Here St. Augustine advises his deacon that as soon as he has delivered this homily to the catechumen, he should be asked whether he believes these truths and earnestly desires to observe them. True belief leads us to change our lives. And here we are warned of the common traps many new and old Christians fall into. The first trap is not knowing how to properly read the scriptures. If you read a section in the scriptures that appears to conflict with the law of God and the love of eternity and of truth and sanctity and the love of your neighbor, you should read that section of scriptures figuratively. As a parable relating some truth, you should endeavor to understand that section of scripture in a way that increases in your heart your love of God and your love of your neighbor. And this is the primary teaching of another one of his works that we've done a video on. It's one of his key works on Christian teaching or on Christian doctrine, which is an essay solely on how to read and interpret Holy Scriptures. Very influential in the medieval church and into the church up to this day. We know by definition that these two core teachings are eternally binding. We are created in the image of God, and these two core teachings are what make us Christian. But for all other rules, if a rare occasion arises, where an overly strict teaching of a minor rule causes a conflict with these two core teachings, that we should love God and love our neighbor. Then a dispensation is a possibility. 
Furthermore, you should not see your neighbor in a carnal manner, but rather see the dignity and humanity in your neighbor, so you can gently water the mustard seed in his soul. So all whom you meet are slightly better people because you were in their lives. And finally, you should not lose patience with the sinner who lives only because of the patience of God, praying that he may one day be persuaded to repentance. And a final discourse that St. Augustine addressed to the inquirers into the faith. In this final section, St. Augustine suggests a short talk the deacon can give to potential converts who are investigating the faith. It is a much shorter version of the discourse to the catechumens. We'll quote some highlights and interesting passages. The final discourse begins, All visible things will pass away, and all the pomp and peace and solicitude of this world will perish, dragging those who love these pleasures down to destruction. The merciful God, willing to deliver men from this destruction and torment, hindered by the sinners who are their own worst enemies, who resist the mercy of their Creator, who sent his only begotten Son, his word, equal to himself, by whom he made all things, to suffer and die for their sins. And this discourse describes the ark that carried Noah and his family in pairs of animals as the sacramental sign of the church that was to be which at present is floating on the waves of the world and is delivered from submersion by the wood of the cross of Christ. And once again, St. Augustine links temptation to covetousness, to pride, and all the other sins against our neighbors. Believe these truths and be on your guard against temptations, so that not only will the adversary fail to seduce with help by those outside the church, but also that you may decline to follow the bad example of those within the church who lead an evil life indulging in the excesses of food and drink and unchastity, or who live in the pomp and inflated arrogance of covetousness and pride, or be pursuing any sort of life that the law condemns and punishes. Follow the example of good men, bear with the wicked, love all men. For you do not know who tomorrow will repent of their evil so they can live the rest of their lives as godly men. Do not love unrighteousness, but rather love the unrighteous, so that they may notice your righteousness. For not only are you commanded to love God, but also to love your neighbor. Works of mercy and pious humility remind us of the promise of God, that he will not suffer his servants to be tempted more than they are able to bear. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. And of course our primary source is his work Catechizing the Uninstructed in the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, Series 1, Volume 3. And the introduction to this work in the Nicene Fathers notes that it is included in a Benedictine collection. So we must assume that many manuscripts must have survived. Unfortunately, the wording of this section is imperfect. While the translation of the small section excerpted in the Compendium to the Catechism is much better than the Nicene Fathers translation, it too is somewhat flawed prose. We don't know, was the translation flawed? Was St. Augustine in a rush to dictate this long response to his bishop? Did the secretary not transcribe the original dictation accurately? Did the copyist make mistakes copying this over the centuries? Were the translators hampered by the incomplete understanding of centuries-old Latin phrases? Who knows? Sometimes we just have to do the best we can when we try to understand the meaning of the ancient texts. The Benedictine editors say this, St. Augustine undertakes the task of teaching the art of catechizing, and he provides certain injunction in a subtle and apt order, but also without tediousness and in a spirit of cheerfulness. And, of course, we also have as a, a source of the catechism. We have some videos on that. So the compendium, which is a companion to the uh, catechism and has the scriptures and many of the works referenced in this, uh, sometimes in summary and sometimes in complete form, the YouTube description links to the video script in our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And, and please click on the links for interesting videos and other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.